All right, let's see what we can do with flip flops. Because we're spending a lot of energy learning about them, so they should be good for something. Um, let me show you a general picture of what we're heading for, which is something called a state machine. Uh, That's weird. There we go. <coughs> All right, so we're heading for a state machine. Um, flip flops have this notion of memory, they have a notion of state. Their behavior depends on what happened in the past. A T flip flop, you can't just look at the inputs and know what the value is going to be on the output after a clock tick. You've got to know what the current value is because it toggles if T is 1 and it stays the same if T is 0. So it's more than, than a combinational circuit. It's not just the set of inputs, it's also the history of the past that affects the behavior of the system. So a state machine capitalizes on that and lets us create general machines whose behavior depends on things that have happened in the past. For example, a counter. So we might want something which, when the clock ticks, outputs a 0, 0. And then when the clock ticks again, outputs a 0, 1. And then in the next tick, outputs a 1, 0, and then a 1, 1, and then goes back to 0 and keeps going. That's a 2-bit counter. And we can design a state machine that produces this pattern of outputs. And so the general view of a state machine is going to be something with a clock, some set of inputs, which may be one input, it may be no inputs, it may be 12 inputs. So I'm just going to draw a line with a little slash through it, which says there could be multiple lines here. And similarly, a set of outputs. Does that just say in? In and out. And the behavior of this system, how the outputs respond to the inputs into the past, is something that we need something more than a truth table to describe. So one way to describe this is with something that we call a state diagram. So this is a picture. And here's how we could describe this counter with a state diagram. We draw a circle for each state the system can be in. And I'm just going to call this state 0, and state 1, and state 2, and state 3. And underneath each state, I'm going to show what the outputs of the system are in this state. And I'm going to draw arrows to show how we move from one state to another. So a counter is very simple. It goes from state 0 to state 1, to state 2, to state 3, and back to state 0. So that's a state diagram for a 2-bit counter. And these state names, S0, S1, S2, those are arbitrary. They're just ways we can talk about each state. But I could call them A, B, C, D if I wanted. And this counter circuit has no inputs. It's just set up so every time the clock ticks, it moves to the next value of the outputs. But let's make it a little more interesting. Let's add an input. So I'm going to have something that looks like this. There's a clock. I'm going to have one input, which I'm going to call go. And I'm going to have my two outputs, which I'll call q1 and q0. And this is still going to have four states. And I'll just call them a, b, c, d here so we don't get 
two committed to S0, S1, S2, S3. And my outputs will be like that. But now we have an input. And so the way that we move from one state to another is going to depend on the value of that input. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw an arrow. And I'm going to put my input value on that arrow. And this is saying if my go input is 1 and I'm currently in state A, after the next clock tick, I'll be in state B. And if I'm in B and my input is a 1, I'll go to C. And if I'm in C and my input is a 1, I'll go to D. And if I'm in D and my input is a 1, I'll go back to A. But if I'm in A and my input is 0, I'm going to stay in A. And the same for B. And the same for C and D. And I'm going to make a key for reading this because there's some ambiguity here. So in here, I'm writing the name of the state. Underneath it, I'm writing the output values for Q1 and Q0. And on the arrow, I'm listing the value of go. And so with this key and this state diagram, we can completely understand what the state machine is going to do. So it's basically a two-bit counter that I can pause. If my go input is 1, it counts on each clock tick, 0, 1, 2, 3, and back to 0. But at any point, if I set the go line to a 0, it pauses at that count. And each time the clock ticks, it stays in that state, so it stays at that output value. Would 4 give you the same result as that? What do you mean, would 4? Oh, it can only be 0 or 1? Yeah, because there's only two bits. Okay. So here's a way to describe a more complex system. It's a counter that counts up, but can be paused. And we can say stop counting for a little while by setting the go line to zero. The clock is still running. We never tinker with the clock in these systems. Okay, that's a golden rule. Because we could just end the clock with the go line, right? And then if go was zero, the clock would be a zero. But you never want to do that. You never tinker with the clock. Okay, if you do this with automated tools, you'll get warnings saying you're tinkering with the clock, you were told not to. But we can still get this thing to act basically in a way that's ignoring the clock by setting the go input to zero, because that's what we set up the machine to do. So let me show you another state diagram. Let's have you tell me what it does. states W, X, Y, Z this time. What's going on with this machine? How many outputs does it have? How many output bits? Two, right? We're showing two output values for each of these states. How many input bits does it have? What are the two? something can be a 1 or a 0, does that mean you have two bits? No, one bit. One bit. Two possible <laughs> values. All right, so we have one input bit, we have two output bits. So our system diagram would be something like this. <laughs> 
and I'm deliberately making these unconventional names. So in and then out one and out two. And now the grand question, what is the behavior of this machine according to this diagram? How can we describe what it does? I haven't shown a clock, but there's always a clock here. Goes forward on one and back on zero. Goes forward on one and back on zero. If our input is one, it counts up. Zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one, zero, 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 one. But if our input becomes a zero, it starts counting in the opposite direction. It counts down. Basically from three to two to one to zero and back to three. So this is a two bit up down counter. And this input basically set it to one to count up, set it to zero to count down. Good. Now could we add a pause option to this? Why not? We'd need more than one input bit though, because we have one bit saying should we count up or down. We need another bit which says should we count at all or should we stay where we are. And so we would have four arrows coming off of each stage. So if we're running and we're counting up, we'd go to here. If we're running and counting down, we'd go to here. And if we're not running, then we would just stay in this stage, whether you're counting up or down. So your picture gets more complicated. But is the concept of this kind of representation starting to make some sense? Right, so this is a state transition diagram or just a state diagram. And we're, we're representing each condition that your circuit can be in with one of these circles, one of these <coughs> states. We give it a name, we show the outputs, and then we have arrows saying, when the clock ticks, what state do we go into? And if it depends on inputs, we'll list the input values on those arrows to tell us which ones to follow. So that's the general type of machine we're dealing with the rest of the course, state machines. And we're going to build them out of flip-flops, the stuff we've been doing recently, and combinational circuits, the stuff we were doing in the beginning of the course. And here's a general picture for a state machine. There's some sort of memory. There's some sort of combinational logic. Stuff from the beginning of the course. And the memory feeds into this combinational logic. And there may be some set of inputs. and the combinational logic will generate some set of outputs. But the combinational logic also goes back into your memory. And it's that feedback that makes this a sequential circuit. So your memory, this is a bunch of flip-flops. The outputs go into some logic generate some ones and zeros, and those ones and zeros ultimately might change the values that are stored in the flip-flops next time the clock ticks. So this is a state machine. And there's two types of state machines, Mealy machines and Moore machines. This is technically a Moore machine. And I don't want to get into the distinction right now because it takes us down confusing side paths. But the way I've drawn this, um, sorry, forget that. Um, forget about what I just said because that's not a picture of either. All right, so we have two pieces of state machines, the memory piece, which is flip-flops, the combinational logic, which is stuff we get from truth tables and doing k-maps and all that stuff in its gates. And the outputs of the gates usually come back and feed into the flip-flops. So let me show you a state machine with actual parts and pieces. <coughs> 
and let's analyze it. So this state machine is going to be built with D flip-flops. And I've been ignoring these, but our D flip-flops, our JK flip-flops, our T flip-flops, they don't just generate a Q output, they always generate a Q bar also. Okay, which is just the opposite of Q. And having that available, sometimes it saves you from using a lot of inverters. If you needed to have Q bar, you could put it through an inverter, but you could also just pull it off the Q bar output. All right, so here's a machine, it has two flip-flops, and so I'm going to <coughs> index these. 0 and 1, and their clocks are always going to be fed from a common clock source. Again, we don't monkey with the clocks. And I'm going to take Q0 bar and feed that into D1, and I'm going to take Q1 and Q0. And I'm going to ignore those and feed that into D0. And then I'm going to generate a pair of outputs, which I'll call Z0 and Z1. So here's a picture of a circuit. Someone comes up to you on the street, shows you this picture, and says, hey, I'll give you 20 bucks if you can tell me what this does. Right, and we want to know how to do that. So how do we analyze a circuit like this? And if it weren't for the memory part, it would be something we've already done a bunch of times. You could draw all the different input combinations for the logic and show what the outputs are. But the memories add a new wrinkle to this. So here's a procedure we can always use to analyze these machines. Okay, and this is the key to the second half of your homework. So we have two flip-flops. They're D flip-flops. Presumably we know what D flip-flops do, but you, know, you go back to your, your notes and, and refresh your memory accordingly. We don't really have to worry about the clock explicitly. We know the clock is always there. It's always ticking. And our understanding of a D flip-flop is basically what does it do when the clock ticks, okay? So we write some equations. The D flip-flop has one input, D0 here. This flip-flop has an input, D1. So write equations for the flip-flop inputs. So D0 is a NOR of Q0 and Q1. And what is D1? Q bar. Q0 bar. Q0 bar, thank you. D1 is Q0 bar. So step one, write equations for the flip-flop inputs. That's done by looking at the circuit and just tracing through. And when you get lots of wires and lots of things crossing, this can be challenging. And if you do this wrong, you're going to get the wrong answer in the end. So if you have a copy of this, it's useful to sort of, of make a copy of it and trace it with a highlighter or something, right? Make sure that, that you're as close to accurate as possible. All right, so we have equations for D0 and D1. Um, this is probably before step one, but it doesn't matter. Step two, decide how many states this machine has. Well, how do we figure that out? The state is basically the value of each of the flip-flops the combination of values of the flip-flops. So if this flip-flop is outputting a zero and this flip-flop's outputting a zero, that's one state. 
If this is outputting a one and this is outputting a zero, that's a different state. If they're both outputting one, that's a different state. Every possible combination of flip-flop values gives you a different state. So how many possible states are there for this machine? There's four. What if there were three flip-flops? There'd be eight possible, right? Zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, all the way up to one, one, one. So how many states? This is two to the number of flip-flops. All right, now you gotta name your states. This isn't really a formal process, but you're going to want to have a way to refer to the different states. And typically we can do this with just the values of the flip-flops, right? So here's a typical way to do this. I might have one state, which I call zero, zero, which is when both flip-flops are zero. I might have a state, let's call it S zero, zero. I might have an S zero, one, which is when Q1 is zero and Q0 is one. An S10 when this is one zero, and an S11 when this is one one. And that's a pretty safe way to name your states. And I'm using a particular ordering. This first character in my subscript is the value of Q1, and the second character is the value of Q0. But you could call them ABCD, you could call them Betty, Barney, Fred, Wilma. You can call them whatever you want. They're just names. Okay, the thing we call a teapot is not a teapot. That is why we call it a teapot. So, same thing with states. Just names we're using so that we can put them in a table. We don't want to put in a table where we say this is state zero, <coughs> zero, though. Because zero, zero is just a two-bit number. Right, we gotta have some way of knowing that what we mean by that state is the state where Q0 is zero and Q1 is zero. Okay, this is a minor point, but it's really important. So we're going to make a state assignment table. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to list all of my states, whatever I call them, A, B, C, D, whatever, and I'm going to indicate how I know which state I'm in, which is based on the values of Q1 and Q0. And I picked the sort of most natural to me names of states. And so we're in state S1 when Q1 is one and Q0 is one, for example. But again, if you decided to call your states A, B, C, D, this could be A, B, C, and D, or whatever order you like. Okay, here's the big step. Make a state transition table. New piece of paper. So here's what a state transition table looks like. We have a column called current state. And we have a column called inputs. Except in our circuit, we don't have any inputs. So that's not going to have anything in it. But if we had inputs, we'd put those in a separate column. And then we have a column called flip-flop inputs. And we have two flip-flops, so we have two inputs, D1 and D0. And let me... I had space for another column in here. I do. I'm just going to change the name. Current state. 
this current flip-flop output. up in a lot of ways, man. Um, I should swap these two columns, but I'm not going to keep changing this. We're just going to figure out this column before this column. All right, so current flip-flop outputs are going to be Q1 and Q0. Inputs, we don't have any inputs, so for this problem, this column is, is meaningless. Our current state, we have four possible states, S0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So I'm going to list each of these. And so we're going to have four rows in this table. But if we also had an input, we'd have two input values for each of these states. We'd have eight rows in the table. Okay, we have a state assignment table which says if we're in state 0, 0, then Q1 should be a 0 and Q0 is a 0. So I can write down the current values of my flip-flop from my state assignment table. And now we're going to fill in this column using these equations that we came up with. So D0 is the nor of Q0 with Q1. Well, for each state, we know what Q0 and Q1 are. We calculate the nor of those. So 0 nor with 0 is a 1. 0 nor with 1 is a 0. 1 nor with 0 is a 0. And 1 nor with 1 is a 0. Yeah? So why do you use the, um, the, the, the current state as S0, 0 as in Q, is Q1 is first? The um, that's just the way I'm doing it in the state assignment table. You could just as easily have made your table with Q0, Q1. Okay, so it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, but I really suggest you do it like this because every time we do this in class, it's going to be 1, 0 or 2, 1, 0. And if you try to go back and look at what's going on and they're flipped around, it's going to be confusing. But the book does things differently sometimes. They start from 1, so they'll do 2, 1 instead of 1, 0, and so on. But I'll be totally consistent if I can and index from 0 and increase. But in the end, you'd get the same state diagram. All right. So, so I messed these up. We would fill in this column next, okay? And this is the column that says, if we have a D flip-flop, and, oh, I only did D0. We have to do D1 also. So D1 is Q0 bar. So Q0 bar looks like a 1, a 0, a 1, and a 0. So there's D0 and D1. Okay. So we have a D flip-flop. We have a clock going into it. We look at our table for a D flip-flop, and it says if D0 is a 1, what's the value of Q after the clock tick? And do you remember a D flip-flop? I think I threw it out at three. Close. So one. <laughs> so let me uh, let me do a D flip flop. Yeah, I know it's 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 pretty crazy. So that's what a D flip flop does. On the rising clock edge, if D is zero, Q becomes zero. If D is one, Q becomes one. All right, so flip-flop zero. We're just going to do flip-flop zero. 
The D input is zero after the clock tick, the output's gonna be one. Here, the input is a zero, so after the clock tick, Q is gonna be a zero. Third and fourth rows, same thing. D is a zero, Q will be a zero, D is a zero, Q will be a zero. Switch to flip-flop number one, Q1, D1. Q is a one, D is a one, after the clock, Q will be a one. D is a zero, Q will be a zero. One forces a one, zero forces a zero. And in this case, and only this case, this looks exactly like this. Okay, that's because that's how D flip-flops work. The Q output is whatever the D input is. I missed it. I don't know if you said Why did you cross out the inputs on that line? Because there's no inputs in this circuit. Oh, okay. Right, we don't consider the clock an input. But if we had something else like a go signal, right, that would be an input. And then we'd have two state variables and an input. There'd be three inputs, basically. So we'd have eight rows in this. Gotcha. That's the next example we're going to do. Okay, so we listed our states. We wrote down what the corresponding Q values were for each of those. We used our equations for the D inputs to write down the values of D. And then we used our knowledge of a D flip-flop to say if this is the value of D, what's the new value of Q? And now the last piece is given this value of Q's 1, 1, what state does that correspond to? That's state S1, 1. 0, 0, that's state S0, 0. 1, 0, that's state S1, 0. And 0, 0, that's state S0, 0. So now we've got our state transition table done. So our last step draw a state diagram. transition diagram. New sheet of paper. So what information do we have on here? If your current state is 0, 0, your next state is 1, 1. If your state is 0, 1, your next state is 0, 0. If your state is 1, 0, you stay in state 1, 0. And if your state is 1, 1, your next state is 0, 0. Well, that's pretty confusing, but if we draw a picture, we may be able to make some sense out of it. So I'm just drawing a picture of four states. Doesn't matter where I put them on paper because I'm just gonna draw arrows. So if we're in state zero, zero, when the clock ticks, we go to state one, one. If we're in zero, 1 and the clock ticks, we go to state 0, 0. If we're in 1, 0 and the clock ticks, we stay in state 1, 0. And if we're in 1, 1 and the clock ticks, we go to 0, 0. So barring mistakes, and this was not what I intended the machine to look like, so I may have made a mis mistake somewhere. But barring mistakes, what does this machine do? Well, it's kind of a weird machine. If you happen to start in state 1, 0, you stay there forever. <laughs> Nothing changes. If you happen to start in state 0, 1, you go to state 0, 0. And once you're in state 0, 0, you ping back and forth between that and state 1, 1, and you just bounce back and forth between those forever. Now that's not at all obvious from looking at this circuit, right? So that's why we have this procedure that we go through from this circuit that will take us to a state transition table and then let us draw a diagram and hopefully make some sense out of what the circuit does. So that's the whole game of chapter four. Okay, that's, that's what the whole second half of the homework is, is, is analyzing state machines like this. Okay, so this is half the story. This is the analysis side.
there's another piece of the story, which is the synthesis side. If we were to start with a diagram like this, how the heck do we come up with a circuit like this? Okay, that's chapter five. So that's later. <laughs> but the first step to being able to do that is being able to analyze a circuit and turn it into a diagram. <coughs> All right, you ready to try another one? Yeah. I use the back of all those sheets of paper. So this time we're going to use T flip flops. <laughs> are ticked together and I'm going to tie T0 to 5 volts through a 1k resistor so that's a logic one and in this case I am going to have an input which I'm going to call U and I'm going to take Q0 and U, and I'm going to XOR them, and I'm going to feed that to T1. And here's Z0. I think I abandoned our Zs in that last example, but the Zs are just equal to the Qs. How many states? Four states, because we got two flip flops. Two to the second is four. What should we call our states? I'm not going to call them S0, 0, S0, 1. Okay, I like it. Our states are called A1, A0, B1, B0. And remember, your state depends on the value of the flip-flop, so I'm going to make an assignment. This assignment can be completely arbitrary. But since we wrote them in this order, I'm just going to assign them like that. All right, what are the inputs to the flip-flops? What are they called in this picture? So how many inputs does a T flip-flop have? Which are? Zero, zero is a pair of bits. Zero and one is a bit. I'm looking for the name of it. So one flip-flop. So what, what's a T flip-flop look like? Right, so technically how many inputs? Whoa. Technically this is the only input. This is the clock. We don't consider that an input. Okay, so it has one input and they always have a pair of outputs, which is basically one output Q. All right, well, we have two T flip-flops, so we should have a total of two inputs, T0 and T1. So I think I listed it as our first step, but we're doing it 
after <coughs> our state assignment table, write an equation for the flip-flop inputs. So what's an equation for the value of T0? T0 is just equal to 1. It's about the simplest equation you could hope for, except maybe 0. <laughs> what's an equation for T1? That's an exclusive or. Should have put a circle around here. Exactly. This is u xor with q0. Okay, so that brings us to, we wrote the equations, we found how many states, we made a state assignment table, we got to make our state transition table now. And we have all the information we need right here. Okay, in fact, at this point, we can throw away the circuit if we want. All we need is the state table and these equations. So let's do this in the correct order. So we'll have current state. And we'll also have the inputs. And we do have an input now. It's called U. So we've got four states and one input. So um, state A1 and our input U could be a zero. Or we could be in state A1 and our input could be a one. Or we could be in state A0 and our input is zero. Or A0 and our input is one and so on. So the combination of current state and input, we have eight possibilities. Because we have four possible states and we have one input value. So for each possible state, two input values, it's a total of eight possible states. Okay, so let's add current flip-flop. So we've called these Q1 and Q0. And we read these from our state table. If we're in state A1, we know Q1 and Q0 are both 0. If we're in state A0, we know Q1 is a 0 and Q0 is a 1. State B1, our flip-flops are 1, 0. And state B0, our flip-flops are both 1. So that tells us our current Q values. And now we want to write down the inputs to the flip-flop. So flip-flop inputs. So there's a T1 and a T0. Well, I'll do T0 for you, I'll give you a break. So there's the T0 input. So what about T1? So T1 is U XOR with Q0, right? So we want to take this column and this column and do an exclusive OR, and that will give us the value of T1. So 0 XOR with 0, 1 XOR with 0, 0 1, and 1 1. Okay, good. You know <coughs> XORs. And this looks exactly the same. Mm -hmm. The ex 
So is if x four is just zero one <coughs> or one zero is a one, otherwise it's a zero. So it looks like this. So it's like an or except for this last row. Okay. Where if they're both one, it's a zero. And while we're here, let's go ahead and add our outputs because I, I specified some outputs Z1 and Z0 here. And Z1 is just Q1, Z0 is just Q0. So we don't really get any extra information. minutes left but we can do this um, let's figure out what the next flip-flop outputs q1 plus and q0 plus and this is where you get lots of exercise with different kinds of flip-flops so we have a t flip-flop and the clock's going to tick so let's just look at flip-flop one if the t input is zero what happens when the clock ticks to the output? Anything? It's unchanged. What's the current value of Q1 in this first row? It's a zero. So after the clock tick, it's still going to be a zero. Flip-flop zero, though, the T input is a one. So what's going to happen to the output on the clock tick? It's going to flip. What's the current value of Q0? Zero. It's a zero, so after the next clock tick, yeah. it's gonna be a one. And you do that for all of the rows of your table. And we can sort of shortcut it. If T0 is a one, which it is in all of these cases, Q0 is always gonna flip. So this zero will become a one, these ones will become zero those zeros will become ones, these ones become zeros. Okay, but this might take you 10 minutes to do what I just did, <laughs> right? Because this is how you figure out better what these flip-flops do. Okay, flip-flop one, anywhere that the toggle input is a one, Q is gonna change value. So these two rows, T is a one, those zeros will change to ones. Here, this is a zero, it'll be unchanged. Here, the input t is a zero, so q will stay unchanged. It's currently a one, it'll be a one. Here, it's going to flip, so that'll become a zero. This will flip to a zero. This will be unchanged. One more step here. We know what the new value of the flip-flop outputs are. Let's just write down from our state assignment table what the new state is. So zero, one is what we called a zero. 1, 1 is what we call B0. 1, 0 was B1. 0, 0 was A1. And we'll do the same thing down here. This is B0. This is A0. This is A1. And this is B1. Now all we need is this and this and we can make a state table. Let's do it. So there's my states. If you're in A1 and your input is a zero, you're gonna stay, you're gonna go to A0. So this is what an input of zero does. If you're in A1 and your input is one, you're going to go to B0. So that's what an input of one does. If you're in A0 and you input zero, you're gonna to go to B1. And if you're in A0 and you input a one, you're going to go to A1. B1 and zero takes you to B0. B1 and 1 takes you to A0. B0, 0 takes you to A1. 
and B01 takes you to B1. And we can list our outputs. When you're in state A1, your output is 0, 0. When you're in state A0, your output is 0, 1. State B1, your output is 1, 0. And B0, your output is 1, 1. So that's the state transition diagram that corresponds to this circuit. And in the last few seconds, can you describe what this is doing in words? Yeah, it's counting up and it's counting down. If u is 0, it counts up 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. If u is 1, it counts down 0, 3, 2, 1, 0, 3, 2, 1. So that's your up down counter. Okay, so that's, that's, that could be a three week lecture we just did. Okay, if this was like a semester length course, um, there's a lot there. Okay, so what I want you to do is work on the homework and take it as far as you can. And then post on the discussion board on Canvas if you get stuck. Okay, and I'll be around, I'll try to chime in and nudge questions in the right direction towards answers. Is two the only one you want us to skip? Skip two, but the other should be doable. What does PSNS stand for? Present state and next state. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and there, there's probably terminology in those questions because I took those from, from the book. Um, there's probably terminology like that. Things like that come up. Shoot a note on the discussion board, okay, and, and I'll chime in. Because I wanted to go through the homework, but we don't have time for that. So do what you can. Have a good weekend. I will see you on Tuesday.